So uh, my name is Chris, and I joined Facebook very specifically to work with the accessibility team to understand how um, people with disabilities are using things like social media. Um, my career progression personally has been one of kind of larger and larger populations to impact, going from kind of a small research university to some, some kind of middle tier companies and then to somewhere really huge like Facebook where it's very hard to have a larger impact than on a, a demographic of, of Facebook's community size. So that's what we're here to do. And I'm gonna talk you, you through a few of the things that we've done to make Facebook more accessible, and then also where some of the research I've been doing over the last year and a half or so has been taking us in some new directions. So you've probably seen our mission statement before. Um, we actually revised this last year and made a big deal of it in the press. Um, Facebook wants to give people the power to build community and bring the world closer together. And that really does mean everyone. Um, I meet with every design and research new hire who comes through my accessibility class, and I tell them that there's not an asterisk on the end of this statement that says it's only true for people with functioning eyes, ears, and hands. So, assuming that's true, they need to consider at every step of the design process whether or not they're, con they're making something that people can use without one of their senses or with limited dexterity, things like that. And it really is true that it impacts every design all the time. Like, that's the mission that I live, and it's what I take to all the teams that I work with. So I want to show you just a couple of statistics and things like that that we know about Facebook. And I'm going to skip automatic alt text. It's probably something that you've heard about before. Um, it's what Facebook usually talks about with accessibility is that we describe images. But we have a few other interesting stats I'm going to walk you through. One is that we know around 100 million people are using the Zoom in their browser when they come to Facebook every day. 100 million people are making the text bigger. Now, that's an interesting signal. It doesn't tell us why they're doing that, but there's several different reasons why they, they might need larger text. It may be that they have a visual deficit and they need larger fonts than are typically displayed. Or it could be that there's too much content on screen, so they want to increase the size of it to shrink it in their browser and see less at once. There's lots of different things that could be going on. Now, we happen to think that this is probably related to uh, low vision, more so than a cognitive decline. But that's actually for a second signal that's kind of similar, and it starts to, to send us in the right direction. Um, we know that around 20% of our app users on iPhones and Androids are increasing the font size on their device. That's one in five Facebook users every day. This is actually a larger raw number than the one that I just showed you. It's a huge, huge population of people who are making the choice to increase the font size on their phone. Now, I wouldn't claim that one in five Facebook users have a visual deficit. This could be just be for convenience. It could be for lots of other reasons. But it does suggest that beyond just Facebook, phones may well have too low a default font size for many people. And a number of apps are trying to cram too much onto the screen at one time. Pixels are very precious. Uh, in fact, if, if an app is monetized in any way, pixels actually have a dollar value. So increasing font size gets into some really fraught conversations sometimes with people. But if we design the right way so that we respect these user choices, we let people increase their font size and everything still works, then we're doing our jobs. So switching gears a little bit to talk about what we know about video, there's actually about 100 million videos on Facebook watched every single day. Lots and lots of video. This is actually a stale number. I wasn't able to get an updated one since we've launched Facebook Watch, so I'm sure it's much higher now. Um, now that we have a, a dedicated video product, but there is tons of video being watched on Facebook all the time. Now, this leads to an interesting accessibility issue in that we have a lot of video going out to populations who maybe can't hear it, or they might need assistance to engage with it fully. So this is actually why Facebook took on in 2014 adding captions to Facebook. So we have continued to iterate on this uh, product feature over the years. Uh, when we first launched it, it was actually pretty basic. It looked a lot like the screenshot here. Um, actually, it's a little bit more rudimentary. This is a more recent screenshot, but I didn't have one going back that far. So this is pretty close. Um, you have white text on the bottom of a video. It was predominantly at that time uh, in, in desktop browsers, but this is how people were experiencing video. When we began to hear that people were increasing the font size a lot, we realized that this was a serious issue because font was responding in uh, the text in the app, but not necessarily on the captions. So we iterated on our captions feature and we, we made it so that you can increase the font size of captions in addition to the rest of the text on Facebook. And we continue to do this year over year where we're just building on the accessibility features that we have. 
So in 2016, we modified it further so that you could actually change or choose how these captions are going to be displayed to you. You could change the color, you could add a different background, et cetera. And this was on the desktop version of Facebook again. On mobile devices, we just respect your choice. So if you decide to change the font or change the color, if you like bright blue Comic Sans on your phone, then we will display bright blue Comic Sans captions on, on your device. Um, we just feel that this is the best way to reach people where they really live and, and give them the choice that they want. 2017 was probably our biggest milestone so far for our captioning services in that we launched it as well on Facebook Live. Now, this is actually pretty huge because it now means that live content producers on Facebook can work with a captioning service <laughs> to inject captions right into their live streams. And this is going to be pretty game-changing as more and more live content uh, enters the ecosystem. So you're probably patiently or maybe impatiently at this point waiting for me to get to the cognitive uh, research that we have done. Well, I would argue that captions are actually a really useful cognitive aid for a number of people. So it's not just a low vision or, excuse me, a, a hearing loss related feature. But we really needed to know more about these communities. And that was actually a challenge that I took on um, earlier this year. So one of the challenges, and I kind of alluded to this in the Q&A earlier, is that our data is sometimes limited about who people are. So we had a we had a gap in knowledge about the overlap between the disability community worldwide and who was actually using our platform. There really aren't good hardware signals. There aren't like metrics or things that we can monitor to know uh, who certain populations are. Like for instance, dyslexia or ADHD. That doesn't really leave a fingerprint in the app that might let us know how large a population this is and whether or not it's one that we should be allocating more resources to serve. So famous last research words, I ran a survey. <laughs> Uh, a really, really big survey. Um, this actually was run in 50 countries, in 50 languages, um, launched directly through the Facebook app in two languages each. So basically people could choose the language of their device or the language of the region that they lived in, and whichever one they selected, they took the survey in that language. And we asked a really simple question, which is, do you have difficulty performing any of the following activities? This was sort of the top line entry point for this global functional survey. And they had six choices. They could say that they had difficulty with reaching and grasping, organizing their thoughts, uh, producing speech, walking around, standing, climbing, that sort of thing, um, or seeing. Now these are broad functional categories. They're not disabilities. We did not want anyone to disclose health information or anything even close to us. We just wanted to know what is it you can do and how does it impact your ability to use our app. What we found was really pretty surprising. It was about three in 10 of our respondents all over the world said, yeah, I have a problem with at least one of these six criteria. Now, somebody could say they had none, but they could also choose multiples as well. So one of the follow-up questions that we found particularly interesting was that we asked them, okay, does this difficulty that you have uh, cause difficulty for you on Facebook? And it was about 16 and percent of the survey sample said, yeah. I have difficulty with one of these six areas, and it impairs me on Facebook. Now that's actually pretty huge. This is about one in seven people. So if you're familiar with the WHO stats around the, the total number of people in the world with a disability, this is actually pretty close. It's not an apples to apples comparison. This is a different survey instrument than the, what the WHO has used, but it's actually really inspiring to me to know that the community of, for disability around the world is fairly closely matched on Facebook. But it does differ in terms of the mix of who people with disabilities are on Facebook relative to the global populations. So when we break this out a little bit further, that was kind of the top line of at least one of those areas. This is the percentage of people who answered this survey and said that they had one of the six categories. Now you'll note here that difficulty with remembering, concentrating, organizing thoughts dominates, followed by producing speech. So the cognitive related issues here are actually eclipsing the others on Facebook. Lots more people, and this was true of all 12 regions that we defined to, to um, analyze the data, had issues in these areas as opposed to physical or sensory ones. So if we look a little bit more closely at what's going on in the, the cognitive data, we see some interesting patterns. This is um, the same question set, basically, broken out according to age band. So we have you know, basically age demographics, 13 to 17, 18 to 24, et cetera. And we see quite a spike in teens and 20-somethings for people who are reporting that they have difficulty in this area, but actually a decline in older age. Now that doesn't track with what we know is true about age-related cognitive decline. 
But it does make sense if we think about how the survey was implemented and who the, and who the potential population is. What this is suggesting to me is not that cognitive decline is a, a non-factor for users of Facebook, it's that they're not, they're not on the platform at all. They're either older and not using Facebook, or they were unable to respond to the survey instrument. This was self-report data done at scale. So had we been able to go door to door with 55,000 people, we probably would have seen something a little bit different than making people take a survey online. Now, the other thing I'll point out that I personally find very interesting is this spike in the teen years. Diagnosis is better now. It makes sense that more teens and 20-somethings would know that they have ADHD, dyslexia, or other cognitive conditions and be able to self-report them back to us. Now, just highlighting the diversity issue that you, you mentioned, um, as a follow-up question, we asked people to select a statement that, was, uh, that most closely described the, the difficulty that they had. Again, not getting into like specific health issues, but um, could they be a little bit more specific so we could begin to categorize and quantify how large an issue these were. And nearly half of people who said that they had issues with, um, related to organizing thoughts or memory didn't really like our selection choices very well. They just said, no, none of these describe me. So it actually does highlight quite well that this is a really diverse population and people have a very specific point of view on these things. Now we have to do a ton more work on this. It's actually a really enormous, rich data set. I'm, I'm hoping that um, CSUN will like this too and you can come and hear more and more of the details and things like that next year. Um, but so far it's been really engaging for the, the teams that I work with because it helps them to know, all right, I, I heard you about the World Health Organization stat, but I didn't necessarily believe that those people were on Facebook. Now it's undeniable. One in seven of our users do have these difficulties and we have to design the right way for them. So I have one more thing to share. Am I on time? Ish? Uh, about one minute you have. Yeah. Crap. Okay. <laughs> so skip to the end. Um, two of my colleagues, um, Dr. Xiaomei Wu and um, Dr. Lindsay Reynolds are two other researchers at Facebook, and they're actually investigating dyslexia solutions. Like, can we help people on Facebook who have dyslexia do a better job of overcoming the anxiety related to it? And with their initial data set, what they found is that more people said they had trouble writing than reading. The reason for that, I'm sorry I'm sailing through this so fast at this point, is that they get a lot more negative feedback. If they make a mistake, somebody will say, you screwed that up. And that actually causes them to not want to uh, post on Facebook any further. So once they react to it, if they get a lot of negative feedback, what they find is that people with dyslexia are more likely to go back and delete it or just post less in the future. So they become less engaged on Facebook and they're less able to take advantage of the, the meaningful interactions that they can get from it. So uh, my last request to you is here is my email. I would love to talk to you or the communities that you represent. Uh, we do a ton of this work and we need to do a better job of reaching out to cognitive disability communities. So please feel free to reach out and I'll be here all day. Thanks.